those things yet yeah, to, to watch this space. Great question. Other questions? Well, we're going to have some time throughout the panel to further discuss. Thank you so much, Ricky. That was Thanks, wonderful. everyone. So now I'd like to introduce our next two speakers on the program and their title of their talk is Indigenous owned Savannah carbon farming projects create multiple benefits. I'll quickly read over their bios. Firstly, I'd like to introduce my grandfather, Gamarang Dr. Otto Bulmania Campion. He's a senior grower willing ranger and land manager at Arafua Swamp Ranger Aboriginal Corporation, ASRAC. He attended his traditional school on country program with elders in Northeast Arnhem Land, then attended Charles Darwin University and gained work experience through CDEP. He participated in the establishment of the Grow Willing Swamp Ranger program, then became senior in the community and he is an Aboriginal researcher living in his community and supporting five satellite based rangers living surrounding Arafua Swamp, including Sea Country. And joining him today is Anna Bostead, who is coordinator of the Indigenous Carbon Industry Network, she earned a Bachelor of Arts in Environmental Communication from Deakin University and a Master's Degree in Tropical Environmental Management from Charles Darwin University. Her work experience prior to joining ICIN included roles with Landcare NT, the Environment Centre NT and Nelsma. So if I could please have you two lovely people up. Thank you, Marlon, for that lovely welcome. And I just wanted to acknowledge that we're meeting on Larrakee country today and pay my respects to elders, um, past, present and emerging. Uh, uh, as um, Marlon was saying, I'm the coordinator of the Indigenous Carbon Industry Network. So um, first off this afternoon, I'm just going to kick off with a few slides to explain what the Indigenous carbon industry is and also um, what the network itself does. Um, and then I'll hand over to uh, Dr. Otto Campion to uh, talk about um, the importance of cultural governance and traditional ecological knowledge. So in, in case you haven't heard of the Indigenous carbon industry network, we're a relatively new uh, organization that formed out of the 2018 North Australia Savannah Fire Forum and it includes around 35 Indigenous organizations supporting Indigenous owned mostly Savannah carbon farming projects across North Australia. We also have a broad, broader network including around 500 people and we have some funding from the governments across North Australia with additional support from the Nature Conservancy. Um, I am the coordinator part-time point eight, and we also have a communications officer who supports knowledge sharing through the network. Our purpose is to enable and empower indigenous carbon producers and traditional owners of carbon projects to benefit from carbon markets through their land and sea management practices by supporting an active network of indigenous carbon businesses and supporting agencies. And we're currently engaged in a governance review and we're just at the final stages of that governance review with our members, um, with the intention being to uh, launch an independent, uh, not-for-profit Aboriginal owned company in the next few months. We have a website with further information about the industry and about what uh, Indigenous uh, Savannah carbon farming involves. So I encourage you to check that out if you'd like further information. We also host the annual North Australia Fire Savannah Fire Forum. And uh, unfortunately, that we needed to do that online this year uh, due to COVID. 
uh, but the year before we were able to get together face to face and support uh, over 300 people from across Australia to get together to talk about Savannah fire management. So the Indigenous Savannah carbon farming industry began in 2006 from one project in the West Arnhem Land region, um, which is referred to as WALFA. That um, emerged from a partnership with traditional owners of West Arnhem Land, Conoco Phillips and the NT government and scientists at Charles Darwin University. And traditional owner, landowners and Indigenous ranger groups undertake early dry season burning to limit the extent of destructive late dry season wildfires. And from the results of, of that uh, important work, then groups are able to claim carbon credit units as a result of the accounting of this, the emissions that are saved through Savannah fire management. Buyers of, uh, of Australian carbon credit units or ACCUs include the Australian government via the Emissions Reduction Fund, or um, increasingly there's a lot more, a bigger market emerging through voluntary sales to corporate buyers that are seeking to offset their carbon emissions. So um, they, the government market gen generally has a lower price because it, it, it uses a reverse auction system which favours the lowest price. So we're generally seeing a trend shifting towards uh, sales to the voluntary and, and corporate markets. And on those markets, Indigenous carbon credits are able to achieve a significant premium in recognition of all the multiple benefits they could deliver through their fire projects. At the 2020 Savannah Fire Forum, the Charles Darwin University um, North Australia Fire Information Service I had, did some analysis which showed that uh, North Australian fire management is now recognised as world practice. Um, and they've, they've do, done that analysis through um, satellite imagery. And through this satellite imagery, they're able to work out the when uh, areas were burned and to what extent. And that all that information feeds into a program called SAVFAT which is how the uh, carbon credit units are calculated from that information. So there's a lot of very sophisticated tools that are used in the Indigenous carbon industry. And um, this is one of the key ones, the North Australia Fire Information website. And they now also have an app which uh, rangers can download to their phone when they're out doing their burning and see where, for example, there might be hot spots where there's fire, hot fires burning and also um, to see the results of their fire management work earlier in the season. So at this time of year in the early dry season, fire burns much cooler and uh, through the early dry season burning, um, it prevents the hot widespread bushfires from occurring later on in the season. There are also other methods emerging um, which uh, opportunities for Indigenous organisations to support their land and sea management work and to gain economic value and economic recognition of their work. And some of these include the beef cattle herd management method, the human induced regeneration method. Um, there's currently three Indigenous owned projects, but there's a significant scope for growth of for those projects to um, and particularly for those to be Indigenous owned. And there's a significant growth in, we're seeing significant growth in the number of HIR projects across Australia and particularly in Western Australia over the last 12 months. Uh, the, the Savannah carbon farming projects, there's two types of methods that can be applied. The first method is um, accounting for the, the emissions or smoke that's avoided from those, avoiding those hot fires later in the season. And the second accounts also for the logs or sticks on the ground, and it's a sequestration method, which is accounting for the carbon stored in the landscape. So that has significant implications for um, owners and managers of carbon projects because there's a, a long-term commitment of 25 or 100 years. 
the current state of the industry is there's currently 32 Indigenous owned savannah burning projects across North Australia, and that's enabling improved Indigenous fire management across over 17.9 million hectares of North Australian savannah. That's generated around $95 million in carbon credits since 2012. And we're seeing a steady increase in the price uh, of Indigenous carbon credits in the market. And it's also importantly abated over 6.1 million tonnes of emissions since 2012. So that's a significant contribution to uh, the global effort to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but it's importantly also a significant contribution to protection of biodiversity and um, achieving important social and cultural benefits in Indigenous communities and across Australia. Around 7% of Australia's total, credit, total carbon credit units are produced by Indigenous carbon businesses. So the Indigenous carbon industry is a significant player in the market. And importantly, 73% of the carbon credits produced through the method, the Savannah burning method, are Indigenous owned. Uh, we did some uh, research with our members through the network um, and we did a survey with I think 17 uh, organisations participated in the survey and they indicated that there were key areas for investment of the revenue of uh, these projects, which deliver significant co-benefits. So those include um, obviously investing in the fire management itself, which is expensive. And so it's important that an important part of supporting those fire management projects is using the revenue gained through the sale of carbon credits to support further fire management in future years. Also employee, employing rangers and uh, other, other uh, staff to deliver the projects. And that, importantly, that's often um, providing employment opportunities on country in very remote areas where employment opportunities are scarce. And also contributing to planning and supporting intergenerational exchange of traditional knowledge. And also we'll be thinking about that in a minute. There's also been investments back into the infrastructure to support communities and community development, as well as training and uh, research projects. There are, uh, as I was uh, mentioning earlier, there are significant additional benefits delivered by these, project, by these projects that aren't captured um, within the carbon credit price. And so they're yet to be, they're yet, their value is really yet to be determined fully. Um, so there's work to be done to ensure that the future of the carbon industry remains driven by re recognizing indigenous ecological knowledge and land and sea management practice. And that holistic management by indigenous people is not lost or mistaken by or, or overtaken by the mainstream economic drivers. Also, we've seen uh, that through the, their engagement in the carbon industry, Indigenous organisations have reported that they've directly increased the capacity of their own land management um, organisations through engaging in the, in the industry. And the, the industry also supports knowledge sharing through events, ranger exchanges, workshops and networks such as ICIN. And I should say, this is uh, the Annette Miller and uh, the Myanmar Women Rangers who posed with a photo, a selfie photo of their, with the uh, ICIN banner. There are lots of opportunities on the horizon. Um, there's a number of policy barriers to uptake of the 2018 sequestration methods that the government is yet to address and we're working to advocate for those to be removed so that groups are better able to uptake those methods and then they will be able to account for more of the carbon. Uh, also, th there's research supporting potentially up to five times more carbon accounted for in savannah carbon farming through the living biomass method. And uh, I mentioned earlier, there's opportunities emerging in human juice regeneration methods, as well as blue carbon, soil carbon, 
and there's a strong need to support more Indigenous groups to understand the opportunities and the risks of engaging in the carbon market. There's also a strong need to support greater recognition of Indigenous rights and interests in carbon, and to that end, the ICIN has published the um, Best Practice Guide to Seeking Free Prime from Indigenous Communities for Carbon Projects, and uh, these guide this, these guidelines are now endorsed as best practice by the Carbon Market Institute, which is the industry body. And we're working with the CMI to embed that in the industry code of conduct. I'm going to hand over now to Dr. Otto Campion, who's going to um, talk about the importance of traditional ecological knowledge and cultural governance. Thank you, Anna. Um, first, I want to um, acknowledge traditional owners from this country where I'm standing. And um, I think my, um, my talk today, it's not about numbers. It's about how um, Indigenous people will look at um, our language, our country, and our landscape. And I yeah, I'd like to um, maybe go for um, um, short and uh, I'll wait until um, a question if I can answer some of them. But really is your opinion, Yanda B, we've been um, following um, really old story when you look at that first, um, PowerPoint there where all the paintings, like I like I like that crocodile one for this country, him, him telling you how them um, dream time ancestors walk across the country, naming all the places and doing monitoring and valuation. Is it good country and bad country? You can do this, you can't do that. And all the rules that that on, on country, we've been um, putting it together and, tr and trying to um, um, demonstrate and, and tra uh, translate for our um, volunteer scientist partners. So, um, so here um, you can see there's a lot there because we are now are moving forward from our carbon program. Um, you can see uh, the little diagram there about all the old people. They've been walking, looking at country, naming, and and um, from our creator, it, it's separate region. So um, it's good that. Um, we're putting something there out on country and my role is trying to look look at our dreaming stories, our Rome. Um, we we have um, our own rule for that, for that country. And for the last um, 10, 20 years, I've been listening to them elders worrying about unmanaged fire and a lot of feral animal damage taking um, really good uh, topsoil. And now we are dealing with erosion and even changing um, like a tree flowering cycle because it's, it's our um, food chain. That's our indicator. The pointer, you can see, um, like them melders there, they they been telling us many good story for the country, and the one program it's it's helping indigenous mob or my people to connect themselves on country because um, when the policy changed from uh, government. They dismantle every funding that's going out on on, on community for um, housing, road, 
education help. So we are, we are lucky. Um, uh, you can see we got about um, seven uh, ranger group, two or three ranger group employed by co uh, communal government through working on country um, program. And the other, other rest that we put our own carbon money back to, um, to our countrymen and they can, they can tell them story. Uh -huh. They can go and visit. They can smoke them up that country. They can do it, it, um, really good traditional fire management. That's what traditional fire management it's all about. We have to um, look at, you know, people are real happy. If we do right thing for that country, that country in reward us, in give us good healthy animals, good um, family, you know, that can um, stay healthy. Now we are dealing with many different um, problems and, and influence, you know, from all the policy change, but we still here, you can see uh, um, in some area, you, you call that rule book, you know, every organization, every, Every, every company you work by rules and that rule in, in from, in from somebody else. Well, it's same for our Yulungu mob. That rule, they've been put them there from them all people, that language we're talking. And we're telling him not a um, little, little, uh, little picture story. It's, it's a real stuff that you can see. Um, eldest there, they wanna, they wanna yarn, they wanna tell him story. And that's what um, we we want to, you know, take take our talking cycle, going around, meet up with other people, and and start working. So for me, I being you know, going out, working with my people, and trying to get that bush language into um, management language. And sometimes we have to we have to um, work with all the um, right equipment. So I think NEPI, it's a, it's a good mapping program we, we look at. We know our country because we can see our vegetation. We can um, look at uh, all, the, um, all the grass. Sometimes country is sing out for us. We, we want to go that corner. Oh, maybe in good fishing place. Oh, we want to go that corner. So country in life in waiting for us to go back and connect ourselves, which is, um, I think now SREC um, um, plans, we've been um, developing um, SREC cultural database and we're working with um, um, Glenn from uh, Melbourne. So we, we started to look at our own, own um, uh, uh, device or little little um, machine that we go and record all the all the story and when we take that story back in our um, in our office uh, we have to you know make it um, this story in, in like um, um, house and we have two door open and two window open so we work with um, outsiders, and we also work with our, with our community. And um, the story, language, and Rome, it's really important, like in Central or Northeast Arnhem Land, we, we all Yulmo people, we all be people, we wanna, we wanna um, share our story by, by doing um, cultural uh, activity on country, not activity like sport and, and all that. So I think that's where um, our knowledge system is in, in really important because um, we've been taking too much from, from Mother Earth. Now we have to give back. Uh, some of them, my tongue, I can't say, you know, some of the carbon language there, it's, it's, it's too high. But if I, if I, look back and talk my language in really, really high of language too. So um, we always make it easy, simple, and we, we're really lucky with, with all the different other 
partners that we're putting all our story together to tell them outsiders, this is what our country really need, need um, help. So um, passing knowledge on country, we have two ways. Sometimes we bring them in classroom, in building, like university or in school. Sometimes we take people out on country. It's an open air classroom. We learn rule about respecting family. And I reckon that's where uh, this carbon program, it's, it's, it's helping more young. We're not doing it for, um, for fun. Our old people, they've been walking and doing petty fire. Even just like a helicopter, you drop incendiary and you, you make a petty fire. But if you put them lined with drip torch, you speed them up fire because he'll, he'll, he'll turn around, he'll chase you like snake. So we, as a hunter, you mob, we go in front and you, you, um, Balanda, you say, you know, you in dead man's zone. But we, hunter, we want to kill him like a snake. We want to hit him that head part. So some of the photo there, our, our young ones now, we're thinking, are we going to fight this fire? Or we just, you know, just, just, just let them go. And I reckon now from that first Watergan ranges, we, we started to get in there, put all the young ones to go and put them at fire. And I think, um, yeah, fire in, in everything for us, in, in backbone, in tools, in all, in, in all our life, you know, like um, husband and wife and fire in the middle, all the children playing around, they got two way responsibility. When they grow up, they got to respect mother side, and they got to respect father side. And, and they can be a good leader. And that's what I've been going through by listening to them all people, take it seriously because they've been always say, some of you that all gotta, you know what pelk nyar, you burn them early. Otherwise you kill him bushtaka in the mud stuff. And, and murayabulu, whole fire, you make him good rainfall. But if you burn him wrong time, You'll get them big storm. You'll get them everything. And then you gotta start thinking about your, your family. You gotta worry. Your house gonna blow up. And then big more cost when I look at um, costing. You know, sometimes Mother Earth is saying, you're taking too much. Go back to that coal energy. And I think that's where we wanna um, look at, make sure we'll have good temperature for our grandkids coming up. Otherwise, if we run them up, we heat them up, the tsunami will kill us. Or bolung, I call them. And that bolung, him can, him, him can, him can stop. If we, if we want to make him landfall, he'll go for it. As, as long as we, we're all praying or singing, you know, traditional song. That's why that language is really important. Thank you very much. Rom Sorry, oh, Rom, I think um, my countrymen there from Northeast Arnhem Land, it's, it's all from uh, like Yulungumata, Rom means rules, like, like rules or law, law of our country. So Rom in, in, in the law, that's bringing everyone together, family and um, all the like country in some time in mother one and in nephew one. So that's, that's, the, that's the rule. We must follow that rule from what them old people they can see that landscape. 
Thank you very much.